stuff back there. You know, he's kind of our little unsung hero. So no. I appreciate that, Gary. No. No. All right, we are continuing on through our 50,000 mile marriage and family tune up. And here we find ourselves in several scriptures, but we're going to be centered around the book of Ephesians. So keep your finger in there, Ephesians chapter 5. Specifically, verses 25 to 20, 22 through 25, but it's a little means of introduction. Oftentimes, when we read passages such as we're going to study together here, it's there's a lot of misunderstanding um, as it's being communicated. It's easy how easily uh, things can get misconstrued when you start studying these sort of things. But it's a means of introduction. Take a look at this. So, you know, three fingers, 
We've got our main passage right here, Ephesians chapter 5. Then we have Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18. And then 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1. But let's begin right, reading right here. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22. It says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And if they not let the husbands down, it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So if we're talking about roles and responsibilities, number one, if you're following along out on your outline, the key responsibility for the wife is that word submission. Now, the word submission is the Greek word hupokatso. Now, you, that's broken up of two different base roots. You have hupo, which means under, kind of like hypo. You have that word hypodermic, meaning under the skin. So hypodermic, dermic meaning skin. So you have hypo, meaning under, or hupo. And then you have katso, meaning to arrange or to organize. So literally, when it, we're talking about submission or hupo tatsu, it means to come under and to organize oneself under the authority structure, to place yourself under that authority. Now, in the Greek, it's an imperative. Whenever it's in the imperative sense, it's used as a command. Now, it's important to understand when we talk about submission, it's not the husband doesn't force her to do so. The husband does not say, you need to submit. The husband has his own roles and responsibility. The wife willingly puts herself under, hupo, puts herself under the authority of her husband. Now, think about this. Does this give the husband license to be a jerk. Mm -hmm. No. What it does say is that the woman willingly puts herself under the authority of the husband. The husband has no right to lord it over her because we're going to talk about the husband's role in just a second. But she willingly puts herself under the authority of the husband. Because last week when we talked about the man ultimately will be responsible for the, the success or the failure of that relationship. He will have to stand before God and give himself an account before the Lord for his wife, for his children, for his family. So let's detail this a little bit more. What, how, how does this occur? What, how, when you talk about this principle, there's so many different thoughts that goes through one's mind. But let's take the context for what the Bible has to say about this. Notice first of all that it's expressed to your own husband. It's expressed to your own husband, not to other men. There's a lot of people who read this and say, oh, well, the woman needs to be subjected under all authority of all. No. It's only to your husband. So, number two, the example is as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. So, take a note right here. In verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands. Come under the authority of your husbands as if you were following the Lord's authority. The same thing is repeated right there if you're going to turn back to the, the Colossians passage. Okay? So you have your finger right there in Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 3. Two books over. Same exact thing is repeated right there in verse 18. Colossians 3, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands. Same words used right there, Ubotaso, as is fitting to the Lord. So the example is, as we are under the authority of Christ, so also the wife is to be under the authority of the husband. Number three, it emulates the church's subjection to Christ. The same thing that we just mentioned right there, the Ephesians chapter uh, chapter 5 here in Colossians chapter 3. So also is the wife subject to the husband. It emulates the church's subjection 
to Christ. Notice also in verse 24 of Ephesians, let's go back to the verse 24, it says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands, this is number four, in, in everything. Let's get a little bit of detail for what this means. One author puts it this way, Submission is a natural response to loving leadership. When a husband loves his wife as Christ loves the church, in Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 33, then submission is a natural response from a wife to her husband. The Greek word translated submit, hupokatso, is the continuing form of the verb. This means that submitting to God, the government, or a husband is not a one-time act. It is a continual attitude which becomes a pattern of behavior. The submission talked about in Ephesians chapter 5 is not a one-sided subjection of a believer to a selfish, domineering person. Biblical submission is designed to be, the, to be between two spirit-filled believers who are mutually yielded to each other and to God. Submission is a two-way street. That's why we read later in passages it says that submit yourselves to one another. Okay? When a wife is loved as the church is loved by Christ, submission is not difficult. Ephesians chapter 25, 24 says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. This verse is saying that the wife is to submit to her husband in everything that is right and lawful. Therefore, the wife is under no obligation to disobey the law or God in the name of submission. So we ask the question is, what if in the situation you have a very difficult individual to work along with? And that's what we find here in 1 Peter chapter 3. Okay, I put the verse right up here uh, for you to see here, but in 1 Peter chapter 3, that the submission is also to be expressed, and it's supposed to be in the ex exhibition of meekness. So 1 Peter chapter 3 says that even if some do not obey the word, even if a man or husband doesn't obey God's word, it says that without the word, the woman may by her conduct, may be won by the conduct of their wives. You remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I, I showed you that video clip of Lee Strobel, and he was just, he was a hard, hard atheist, and that his wife came to know the Lord as Savior, and this, this wife just exhibited this compassion and this grace, and he said that this, this uh, it was beautiful to him, it was winsome, and he said that, you know, this is really attractive. Maybe, you know, there's something about this Jesus Christ character. It's, it's interesting to me because by her conduct and by her meekness, she was able to express love through that. Because she was being loved by Christ, she was able to express that to her husband who was not following the Lord. And just by that conduct of her behavior, she was able to eventually, he was able to... to come to Christ, and then he would become one of the major uh, uh, apologists or defense of our, our faith uh, today. He wrote several books uh, uh, defending Christ. And so in 1 Peter chapter 3, it's, it's by the, the exhibition of meekness that, that, uh, that uh, the, wife, the wife should uh, show uh, this uh, attitude uh, towards uh, her husband. Now, there are obvious things that we are we are called not to do so if you have a husband who is very difficult to get along with and then you have this wife who's a believer and following along and wants to be living in a in the marriage with him uh, you know obviously there's things that she's not called to do anything that is immoral or anything that would get in between god and ourselves those things we are not called to do our obligation is to follow god first and foremost. But it's in the context of, of love and surrender and compassion that we find this is, this is uh, most, effectively, uh, most effectively used. Um, I remember um, 
when we first were in uh, Plevna, you know, things were going great. Then right at the tail end of our ministry uh, in Plevna back in 2011, um, I just sensed this really, really deep-seated um, need on my heart that, you know, Bruce, you need to you need to move on. Uh, you need to uh, you need to give your resignation here at the church. Everything was going great. The church was growing. Uh, you know, but God just impressioned it all my heart that Bruce, you need to, you need to follow me, and you need to trust me in this. I brought that up to Christy, and she's like, "I trust you. We have no house, we have no job lined up. There's no income, but I'm trusting you enough that your love for your Lord is strong enough that I'm gonna, I'm gonna trust Him at the same time. I'm gonna trust that you're trusting Him." Which is a huge responsibility on the and a weight on, on her on her shoulders. And I found that it took a lot of bravery on her part, not only to trust God, but also trust that my relationship with God was was strong enough and that I was listening to him and I was close to his desires that you know, regardless of circumstances of not having a house and not having a job in, in line, that she was trusting that I was submitting to God. She was willing to submit herself to me so that, because I was being submissive to God. And I'll tell you, when that happened, it was kind of a, a unity and a harmony that worked. Now, the difference is, when you have a relationship and when there's that attitude of submission, both on your part to follow the Lord, it works. There's a there's a strength that, that happens there when you're both submitted to God and then we're fulfilling all of our roles in that manner. Um, let me illustrate it this way. Uh, Aesop uh, gives a fable of, of how this plays itself out. Though, and you may have heard this before, but the wind and the sun were argued one day over which one was the stronger one. And they spotted a man traveling on the road and they, they sported a challenge to see which one could remove the coat from the man's back the quickest. And so the wind began. He blew strong gusts of air, so, so strong that the man could barely walk against them. But the man clutched his coat tight against him. The wind blew harder and longer, and the harder the wind blew, the tighter the man held his coat against him. And the wind blew until he was exhausted, but he could not remove the coat from the man's back. It was now the sun's turn. He gently sent his beams upon the traveler, and the sun did very little, but quietly shone upon his head and back until the man became so warm that he took off his coat and headed for the nearest shade tree. The lesson behind that is a gentle persuasion is stronger than force. That's the example that we are given right here in 1 Peter chapter 3. It's that by your gentle persuasion, wives, you'll change your husband by your compassion and your grace. I mean, there's been times where I know that I've been a jerk and I've been a weird, and Christy and her gentle persuasion and her compassion, it's like, yeah, Bruce, you are a jerk and you're rude, but it wasn't by the words, it was by her loving compassion that changed my heart that way. Now, the woman is not responsible for the conduct of the man. Ultimately, it is the man who is responsible for the marriage. The man will have to stand before God and give account before the Lord the way that he is conducted in his, conducted in his, in his uh, family. The woman is responsible to God for her individual attitude and conduct. But before God, the man is eternally responsible in how he leads and directs his family. Now, you use this principle and you talk about it in a, a society that is, is very, very open and free, and it's a very unpopular kind of principle. Uh, take, for example, what happened in the news a couple of months ago. You, you guys know uh, Candace Cameron Bure? You know, uh, she was on that show. What oh, yes. happened to you? What is, what is that show? Full House, okay. No fan of the paperboy. You know. 
<laughs> you don't remember that? No? Okay. Well, Full House. You know, she was a uh, she was DJ, uh, but she grew up and uh, she married uh, a professional hockey player, and and then she got on the news and she said that I am submitting myself to my husband in the biblical sense, and people were like, "What in the world are you talking about?" So she got on this interview. I'm going to show you uh, a clip of this, but it's. She details as to how this this plays out in her in her marriage. And I think she has a really great perspective on, on how this, this occurs. So this is a Candace Cameron Bior. She's the sister to Kirk Cameron. Um, and so uh, let's take a look right here. Having a healthy marriage is of course a top priority for many individuals while trying to balance a career and balance a family. And so in your book you do share, if I think it's a little controversial, I do want to go to a quote about marriage that I think, I don't know, many women might take an issue with. She was like, oh, okay. my husband is a natural born leader. I quickly learned that I had to find a way of honoring his take charge personality and not get frustrated about his desire to have a final decision on just about everything. I'm not a passive person, but I choose to fall in a more submissive role in our relationship because I wanted to do everything in my power to make my marriage and family work. Yeah. In 2013, the one submissive is a, is, a, is a powerful choice. Sure it is, but um, the, the definition that I'm, I'm using with the word submissive is the biblical definition of that. So it is meekness. It is not weakness. Meek is having it's strength under control. It is bridal strength. And that's what I choose to have in my marriage. And listen, I love that my man is a leader. I want him to lead and, and be the head of our family. And those decisions, major decisions, do fall on him. It doesn't mean I don't voice my opinion. It doesn't mean I don't have an opinion. I absolutely do. Uh, but, but it is very difficult to have two heads of authority. Doesn't work in, in military. It doesn't work. I mean, you have one president. You know what I'm saying? And then you have the vice president, you've got, you've got all the people that are under working with him. And uh, when you're competing with two heads, that poses a lot of, um, can pose a lot of problems or issues. So within my marriage, uh, we are equal in our, um, in our, I'm looking for the right word, importance, but we are just different in our performances within our marriage. But you specifically say, if we disagree on something, mm -hmm. he is right. He's the one that gets to... No, it doesn't mean he's right. But I allow him choice. to make the final choice. Absolutely. Even at the detriment of your family. Uh, yeah, yeah. But obviously, I will make my opinion very clear. And, and clearly, I have been married for 17 years, and we have a very happy marriage, and it works very well. So I trust my husband. But that trust has been built. And, um, and I know that because I trust him and I build him up that he and give him the respect that he would like to have within marriage that he so listens to everything that I have to say and takes my opinion and uh, very seriously and many of the times he will sway to what I would like um, even if he doesn't see eye to eye with me because he really values, values my opinion. Um, so again, I, I use that word, but I but I feel like uh, it's taken so strongly when I'm kind of like everyone just calm down. You see the context, which it works. The, the wife isn't a doormat. It's just that in the the context of trust and of faithfulness and of love, that these things work as as God has planned it. Um, Chuck Swindoll says this, when placed in the right setting, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, the woman's worth is enhanced and her life is enriched by a husband who adores her. There is, in that context, fulfillment and freedom rarely experienced elsewhere on earth. So when you have it in the right context, it works. But when you take it out of context, as such as culture would have you do so, and they hear the word submissive, it's like, you've got the punching bags ready for that. But in the context of what we find when it's the husband fulfilling his role, the wife fulfilling her role, and you put that together, Find right there at the last <laughs> sentence a context fulfillment freedom rarely experienced elsewhere on earth. 
So, yes, that's the responsibility right there, but we're not going to let the husbands down here because <laughs> there's an even, I would say, a tougher responsibility for the husband right here. And the key responsibility for the husband is loving. And it's cord right there, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That means love them completely, love them nurturingly, sacrificially. You think about how Christ loved the church, loved us, he gave everything. Everything that he was, he gave to the church, his people. And that's how us men, we're supposed to love our wives, I think. You thought submission was hard. We got to love our wives with the same context as Christ, sacrificially, nurturingly, completely loved the church. That's our example. So the question is, how can a man love so perfectly, so self-abasingly, so completely that there's nothing left for oneself? How do we follow that kind of example? So let's take a look at the Greek context. Yes, what is this love like? For one, is that Greek word very familiar? It's agape or agapao. It's the same kind of love that's used in the verse John 3.16, for God so loved. That means without expecting anything in return. It's a completely one-sided kind of love. It's a love that doesn't expect love back. That means this kind of love sets the example. Um, it means... You think about the kind of love that God has towards us. It's, the, it's taking the initiative to restore relationships. So God, in heaven, took the initiative to love us in that while we were yet sinners, even that while we hated him, he took the initiative to love on us. You see the kind of love that, that's supposed to, that we're supposed to have towards our wives, men? I think about that, and that means to me that I'm supposed to say I'm sorry first. If I'm supposed to take the initiative just like God took the initiative, that means I need to, even if in your heart you know that your wife is wrong, it's meaning I'm willing to take the step to say that I'm sorry first. If God was willing to take that first step towards us, so also we are to take that first step towards our wives and our family. It means that when you much rather sack out on the couch and watch the Broncos game, it means you get off your duff and spend time with your family. It means you take the personal initiative to go and build that relationship <coughs> with your family. It takes the initiative. That's what agapeo means. The first step. Number two, it's an absolute imperative command. Such as submission is an absolute imperative command. This word for us men to love our wives, it's an absolute command. There is no swaying back and forth. You must love your wife. So husbands, as it says in another Another passage that says, so husbands also love their wives as their own bodies. As much as you love your own body, no man, it says that he who loves his wife loves himself. The more I love on Christy, I'm loving myself even more. For no one hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. As a man loves himself, you know, just as Christ, Christ is the head, he loves the body of Christ, the church, us, his people. He is the head, we are the body. So the same exact thing is that the man is also to love his own flesh. 
when we are united with our wives in the marriage sense that we are of one flesh, that therefore as a man should leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, you have that unity. So also the man becomes the head, but the wife becomes essentially the body right there. That man is to love his own body, love his own person as, it says, so husband also love their own wives as their own bodies, because we are one flesh in that context. So we must treat our wives as we would treat our own bodies. So that means to me, if you don't have the feelings of love, that means you take the initiative to get those feelings back. You are in control of that. You have a choice to love. I, I've seen it in, in many contexts where, where a, a couple will be kind of at each other's throat. And then they make the choice to turn from their sin and repent. And I've seen them come back together and become one again. And in, in Revelation chapter chapter 2, this is, this is a really good context. How do we get that back? You know, how do we find that unity once again? There's a, a, a verse in the book of Revelation, and it talks about, and I'll give it to you right here. It says, go back and do the first works. If you lost that feeling of love or lost that context of love, it, Revelation simply says, go back and do those things you used to do together. Um, there's a book that I, that I often give uh, to couples. It's called The Love Dare. Some of you may have seen this. Um, it's, I, saw, I, have, I have several copies out in the back. If you guys want to pick up one, they're free for you right there on the, the back table. Uh, but it goes along with the, the movie Fireproof. And in this book, uh, and also in the movie, it, the, the character goes through the book and it gives him a dare every single day for 30 days where he is to do something for his wife, just like they used to do back when they, when they dated. And um, it's, you know, do crazy, you know, Things that that you just what what uh, what attracted you to that interview the very the very first time. I remember back in when we first started dating, and we would just do silly, crazy things just for each other. And it didn't matter. Kind of everything else, you know. Christy would like draw on my face. I don't know if she, she would if that would be any, <laughs> anything that we would do today. But we would do like crazy things for one another. And, you know, just uh, date each other and just uh, show compassion and love in, in, a, in, a, in a very intimate sense. And, and what we found here is that as we're reading right here in the text, go back and do those, do those first works. Um, and so you can pick up a copy right here. There's, a, there's a several over there if you'd like to do this little dare. Um, but go back and do the first work. It's an imperative command that we go in and seek uh, this relationship out and, and heal it. Uh, it's active and it's not passive. It's active and it's not, not passive. Um, there's, no, there's no woman out there that cannot blossom and thrive under a truly loving husband. When a, a husband is actively loving his wife, I know I notice how much Christy grows when I am actively loving her, and I notice how much she shrinks and feels back when I am not actively loving her. And so it is active when it talks about right here, men love your wives. It's not just the words; it's actively, it's expressing, it's it's working into it. It's active, not passive. It's also acquainted with the present tense. The husband is to actively choose to love and to nurture its present, and then it continues on. In the context of how that word is used, it's right now, and then it continues. Um, I remember we were first dating back in 1995, I told you last week that we got married 
uh, right after we graduated uh, from, from college uh, because my mom said, you know, don't get married until you, until you graduate from college. So we married the same weekend that I graduated. And what happened, I remember we moved into this, this trailer house. I think I told you about this before, but that, that thing was like from 1908. It was made of tin. And it was, you know, the sun would just beat on that thing. It was like painted brown and black, and it just absorbed every single, you know, x-ray from the sun. And we had candles in there uh, during the middle of the summer, and then we, we left on a trip and came back, and the candles were all <laughs> melted all down the down the mantle and everything. It was, it was like a burning sauna in there, but it didn't matter. We were just so, so excited to be with each other. And just, it was, you know, it was a, yeah, who cares that we were, we were frying in the oven. It's just, we were together. And, you know, um, we had nothing. We had nothing. We, we started our life out $23,000 in debt because of, because of appendicitis on our honeymoon. And, you know, we didn't care at all. And what God says, I want you to go back and do those sort of things that you used to do at the beginning. You know, to love me, to lavish affection, nurture, celebrate that individual. And it's acquainted in the present tense. It continues, it starts at the beginning, and then it continues on. It's present and it's active. The fifth one, this last one, it's altruistically sacrificial. That word altruistic means servant-hearted. It means not what you want, but it's what the other person wants. It's altruistically sacrificial. Now you think about the church, the relationship of the church to Christ. Is the church always reciprocating the love back to Christ? No. Christ is always showing love to the church, but all kinds of church does what they, what they want. They can be real passionate and great at times, but at other times they're kind of withdrawn. And our love gets hot and it gets cold. It's kind of up and down, more like a, a roller coaster. The church isn't always reciprocating the love that Christ shows to it. And it's the same thing to us. That husbands, your wife won't always reciprocate the love that you express. You know what our responsibility to do is at that point? It's that it means you keep on doing it. You keep loving. You know how much Christ loved? He loved completely. He sacrificed everything. It was not about how much love was expressed to him, but it was all the love that he expressed to the church. The same example is given to us as men, as leaders of the family. We are to express this love regardless of circumstances. Bruce Wilkinson says that love is the only business in which it pays to be absolutely lavish. Give it away. Throw away. Splash it over. Empty your pockets. Shake the basket. And you know what? Tomorrow, you'll have more than ever. I'm going to ask Christy a question. I'm going to put you on the spot. But it's, it's a good one. You know, I think you would agree that when I am loving and sacrificial and compassionate and honoring such as Christ loves a church, it's a whole heck of a lot easier to submit yourself to my spiritual leadership when I am loving as Christ loves. But when I am demanding and when I'm rude and uncompassionate, it's like, Friend, you ain't going nowhere. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> in the context of marriage, when I'm loving you as Christ loves the church, it's easy. Life, it works. But in the context where I'm not following Christ and I'm 
doing what is wrong, you know, it doesn't work. Now, what, what I just shared with you, go Frank, is uh, <laughs> what, I, what I just shared with you is, is so unpopular. It's so unpopular in the modern day context. It's so old fashioned. But I think the world needs a little old fashioned. When, I, when I'm all that I need to be spiritually as a son of him, and if I'm fulfilling my role as a husband, as a son to him, the relationship works. And you, you wives will find the same. When you are so fulfilled and content with God, completing your roles and your responsibility as wife is so much easier. When you are filled with God, you know what? It's easier to express that. I, I talk about this as, as the love bucket. Remember that? As God fills your bucket full of his love, it's easier to dole it out to others. But I find in my context and in my life that if I don't allow myself to be filled with his love, I'm, I'm empty to begin with. How do I give others what I don't have for myself <coughs> if I don't allow God first to fill me up? So the example is, is of Christ. The example is of Christ that he fills us with his love and his affection, his nurturing, and that we're able to give that to others. Do you, ever, do you ever see those pictures of those people that get tattoos of their boyfriend or girlfriend on their... I saw this one where this Russian woman got met this one guy and after 24 hours tattooed his name on her face. It was like a full face kind of tattoo. And I'm like, oh my goodness gracious. That, you're expressing some commitment there, because every time you look in the mirror, you're going to see that guy's name written a, across your face. And then this past week, I read this amazing verse. This is cool. Isaiah 49, 16. It says, see, I have graved you on the palms of my hands. You know whose name is tattooed on God's hands? It's a Bruce. Right there on his hand. It says Jerry on his hand. He has tattooed his name, your name, on his hand. And he's expressing, I'm committed to you. I love you. And when you are filled with his love, you know what? When I'm realizing the kind of depth of relationship that I have with God and my Father, it's so much easier to express the depth of love to Christy, my wife, and to BJ, my son, and to Paige, and to Ellie. When I'm filled with his love, I can show love. You cannot have commitment until you have filled yourself with the commitment that God has for you. You cannot have true forgiveness until you have received the forgiveness that Christ has given you. You cannot have peace in your soul until you have given your tumultuous life over to the Prince of Peace. And then, I'll tell you what, when he starts filling you up with that, it's like, I've got everything I need. As Scripture says, my cup overflows. But you cannot give others something that you don't have. And so I'm asking you today, let God fill your love bucket. And your cup will overflow. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we fall so short of what your perfect standards are. I make mistakes and I, I don't I don't love my family as much as, as you could ever, that as you have ever expressed your love to us, Lord, I, I fall so short of that standard. But Lord, you have given us these roles and these responsibilities as husbands and wives and as children 
as employees, as brothers and sisters. You've given us these examples of complete and perfect love because we are, we are light to the world. And Lord, I pray that through and given, given the amount of love that you have expressed to us, Lord, could we, could we have enough reflection of our lives to express that to our wives, our husbands, our kids, our, our employers, our brothers, our sisters, Lord, to, to all those that are around us, Lord, we can't do this on our own. And too, too often, Lord, we've been trying to feed each other out of our empty buckets, trying to do this on our own power, our own will, and, and God, we're, we're saying right now, we're making the choice that we can't do it. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So, God, I pray that you fill us today. We seek first your kingdom, your righteousness, your ways, your paths. We we, we renege on, on our ways. We want to follow you, God. Lord, may this be an example to all of us in, in all of our relationships that, that we would love you full heart, and that by that action of loving you, Lord, you fill us. You, you have our name tattooed on your hands, and Lord, that, that expresses to me that, that you love us with, with a deep, deep commitment, and a deep, deep affection and nurturing, and Lord, from that context of, of being loved, Lord, I, I pray that we, in our our full love buckets will be able to express that to those who are around us. Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for loving us to begin with. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. All of God's people.